Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to some more Starship Troopers lore. We've lavished quite a bit of attention on the human side of the conflict, haven't we? The Terran Federation and the Mobile Infantry. But we've yet to lay eyes upon the opposition, the Arachnids. And what better place to start than with the iconic Warrior Bug. A biological superweapon that positively radiates murder, malice, and mayhem. An individual arachnid warrior is an apex predator whose every single limb ends in cleaving, cutting, piercing chitin. A ferocious opponent more than a match for any mobile infantryman, and yet, an individual arachnid is nothing. It is the teeming trillions spawned forth from cavernous subterranean spaces, the warriors whose numbers can cover planets. That is the true threat, a tool for galactic domination and the unquestioned superiority of bug kind. And as a bonus, he's handsome to boot. The Arachnid Warrior is one of the hands-down best movie monster designs in cinema history. It looks passably realistic. You could imagine an alien warrior bug to look like this. And it also looks dangerous, fast and aggressive. And the design works fantastically well in hordes. The little claws waving in the air, the mandibles opening and closing as they roar, and their larger rear legs giving them a forward-moving offensive feel. But it was not always so. The arachnid warrior we know and love from the movie has come a long way from its predecessor. One of the earliest interpretation of the arachnids, or more correctly, the pseudo-arachnids as they were called in the book, looked like this variant on a novel cover right here. You can see that the idea back then was for essentially just a spider-like creature. And they were fairly small as well, to the point that a brain bug could be easily lifted by a power-armored mobile infantryman. And I think we can all agree that uh, this variant on the arachnids uh, is uh, Perhaps a hint lacking in originality. It's just a spider, but with two googly eyes instead of a billion little ones, and an energy weapon strapped to its back. Though the idea for the arachnids as a species was already coming together. This was further expanded upon in the 1976 board game where we saw yet another evolution of the arachnid warrior. This, not still quite as handsome gentleman, right here. The spider influence is still very, very apparent, but now you've got a bit of a head-like central structure. And you can also see manipulator claws as well, and their directed energy weapons. Oh yes, the pseudo-arachnids were not the close quarter combat slashy stabby terry monsters of the movies. They used guns. Guns. Well, energy guns, but you get the gist. They even had heavy beam weaponry, and they functioned more along the lines of a pseudo-conventional military, where the arachnid hive complex would be divided between several brains that acted like officers and administrators. They would take care of organizing warrior squads and heavy beam weapon teams. They were also in charge of colonies, of starships, and the day-to-day -day running of the colonies, and most importantly of all, of course, taking care of the Queen. Incidentally, if you're curious, this is what a brain bug looked like back in 1976. You know, for once, I gotta say that the actual design of the movies for the arachnids is way superior to the source material, but then again, the original novel came out in 1959. 
quite early on in the history of science fiction, so we should expect some improvements, right? Well, judging by Starship Troopers, yes. Judging by practically every other book-to-movie conversion ever, no. <laughs> that is an exceedingly unreasonable expectation. So, whilst giving thanks and gratitude to whomever designed this beauty, let's have a closer look at it. A deep dive into the biology of the Arachnid Warrior. And befitting its status as a living weapon, we will of course start with their primary instruments of mutilation. The massive mandibles located on its forward section. These two huge scissoring blades um, are filled with muscle tissue, giving the arachnid warrior enough biting force to shear solid steel beams and snap a mobile infantryman in half. But you don't have to be caught up in them to be murdered by them. It being stuffed full of muscle tissue, the mandibles are very heavy. They're also surprisingly keen, as the inner serrated edge and the beaks near the tip is able to tear through infantry armor with contemptuous ease. And of course, bone and flesh is no obstacle whatsoever, as we saw demonstrated when a dying, mortally wounded warrior, with its last breath and final reserve of energy, barely just managed to lurch forward and raise its top mandible to allow gravity to send it crushing down and straight through the entirety of Johnny Rico's leg. In fact, the mandibles really are massively oversized for the task at hand. In all due likelihood, they were the weapons used by the arachnids to subdue the other various apex predator species on their original home world, as they are clearly designed by evolution to kill something a hell of a lot larger and a hell of a lot tougher than a measly human. For the culling of such an inferior species, the warrior prefers to use its two top-mounted claws. Reaching out to well over a meter, they give it greater range than its forelegs or mandibles. The claws are also capable of lightning speed, darting forward like speeding bullets and with far greater force, it seems, um, as they effortlessly pierce straight through their targets. The claws can also be used to slash and cut at the enemy as well, though this is primarily a defensive gesture, as their peculiar form is best suited to thrusting and piercing attacks. And finally, even if bereft of both claws and mandibles, the arachnid warrior still has a weapon to rely upon. It's two pointed and sharpened forelegs. Due to the way they are jointed, primarily designed for speed and locomotion, they don't have the range of the claws or the cutting pressure of the mandibles. But they are still long, viciously jagged, and tipped with a tapering point just as capable of slashing through flesh as the claws are. It was by absolutely no means mere scare propaganda when Games and Theory famously announced that even if you were to blow off an arachnid warrior's limb, it would still be 86% combat effective. If anything, that is an overly optimistic estimate, as even if you were to tear off both the warrior's claws, both of its mandibles, and one of its front legs, the remaining one could probably still kill a human soldier with relative ease. But, even though it is absolutely true that a good offense is the best defense, one should never fully discount the value of a bit of good old-fashioned armor. Or even better, if you can swing it, a lot of armor. And the warrior bug is deceptively well protected. As we see again and again throughout the movie, it often requires dozens upon dozens of 7.62mm high velocity rounds to put down even a single bug. 
This presumably due to the fact that its outer chitin, its exoskeleton, is so tough that it requires almost all of the bullet's energy to pierce through its outer layer of armor, robbing the bullet of the energy required to really truly do some telling damage to the creature's internals. The warrior has also, dare I say it, been intelligently designed so as to ensure the front of the creature, the offensive fighting side, contains as little of true value as possible. The mandibles are nothing more than exoskeleton and muscle. Further behind the mandibles, in what at first appears to be the head region, there are a pair of eyes, which is at least a vulnerability. If you can blind the warrior, well... It can still hear you, and it can still smell you, but at least it can't see you as it eviscerates you. But it is not in fact a head at all. The connections of the eyes go far deeper inside of the creature, as the front section are primarily made up of the stomach sac, the throat passage, and the oral cavity. All of which, of course, don't respond necessarily all that well to high caliber bullets, but neither is it going to slay or cripple the warrior immediately either. Nor can you rely on shock, fear, or pain to prevent it from mulching you either, as, of course, a living weapon has no need for pain receptors. So how precisely do you actually kill one of these critters then? I mean, this is horrifying enough, the fact that it's got six forward-facing weapons, plus armor, plus the fact that they come in their literal trillions, surely they must have some sort of weak point, right? Well, they do. The rearward portion of the arachnid warrior's body contains a large circulatory node. Burst this open, and the warrior will bleed to death internally fairly quickly. If it'll be quick enough to save your life, well, that's an entirely separate question, but it does mean that the arachnid warriors are potentially quite vulnerable to overpressure weapons, the close-in detonation of a high explosive bomb, for example. But if you really want to put a warrior down quick, then why? on God's good green earth, wouldn't you? Then your only real option is aiming for the nerve stem. Yes, yet again, games and theory did not lie to you. The arachnid warrior's central nerve stem, its brain essentially, is located round about here, just above where the legs junction with the main body. Introduce a couple high-velocity projectiles to this area, and the warrior will near immediately lose complete control of its body, rendering it a minimal threat to nearby Terran Federation personnel, and shortly thereafter, unable to breathe, unable to pass blood through its body, etc., it will expire. Of course, getting a clear shot at such a small, rapidly moving target whilst a murder monster is charging towards you is easier said than done, and so I also feel it necessary to mention one other little potential weakness. Marked out here, near the rear of its torso in red, is a tail fin. The arachnid warrior has two of these, one on either side of its body, and they are stuffed full of little sensory organs which help the warrior maintain its balance, a tricky feat for a quadruped with a massively overweight front section and two forward legs that are shorter than the rearward legs. If you were to blow one of these off, you might just buy yourself enough time to get a clean shot at the nerve stem, as the warrior all of a sudden needs to learn how to walk again. Yet, there is of course one minor, tinsy-wincy flaw in all of our theory crafting right here. How to kill an arachnid warrior? That, really, is a pretty 
futile question. As the one you should be asking is, how to kill a thousand arachnid warriors? Well, technically speaking, the answer is still hit the nerve stem. But you better aim quick and reload faster. Particularly also as the arachnid warrior is built for speed. As I mentioned, their rear legs are longer and more powerful than the forelegs, allowing it to leap and push itself forward rapidly in a constant charging movement. The warrior is also surprisingly agile, able to keep its footing even on very rough terrain, able even to climb a mound of its own dead to overwhelm outpost defences considering that that is a mound of moving, squelching, constantly shifting dead corpses, and his legs are four pointed spears, practically, that is one hell of an achievement. And now that we've covered most of the tactical aspects of the warrior, I think it's high time we move over to some strategic aspects of it as well. Because, of course, a fighter is only as good as his commanders. Without getting into the brilliance of the brain bugs here, the warrior is not merely a one-on-one -on -one killing machine, it is also a tool of strategic domination. You can win as many battles as you want, but if you don't win the war it was all for nothing after all. The warrior's ability to move at high speed is vital, as the arachnids of course lack mechanical and motorized means of transportation, their soldiers need to be able to cross huge distances of territory at speed continuously. And they seem to have no problems with that whatsoever. Being able to charge constantly forward using their powerful hind legs to propel them at a tireless pace. The only limitations placed upon them, it seems, is the need for sustenance. Presumably they are fed via the workers, as their throat passage quite awkwardly place right in the front of the warrior's body in between the mandibles would make it very difficult for it to eat on its own. It would also almost certainly require some water as well, again probably fed to it via worker bugs. Once this need for food and water has been taken care of, we can also hypothesize that the warrior can probably keep moving almost indefinitely, as they must have incredible stamina and lung potential, as we on several occasions see arachnid warriors operating in hard vacuum for extended periods of time with seemingly no problems. And considering the environment they grew up in, on Clandathu, it seems extraordinarily unlikely that they don't need to breathe, <laughs> not to mention biologically unlikely. And you don't need to be much of a military genius to see the advantages in an army capable of moving at high speeds near indefinitely. With the only needs they need covered is the occasional snickers break, a quick watering, and maybe a place to poop before continuing onwards. Add on the arachnids' habit of creating vast, sprawling underground tunnel networks, and you have an incredibly offensive, vicious, powerful, rapid-moving army that just so happens to be immune to airstrikes because, you know, underground and all, that can pop up nearly anywhere, at any time, for any reason, and disappear almost as quickly as it appeared. That sounds like it would be a real nightmare to deal with. It might not even be much of an exaggeration to say that the arachnids rule the ground, whilst the Terran Federation claims dominion of the sky. Normally that would lead to a rather one-sided war, but when the opposition can stay underground forever and can take care of all of their logistical needs, including the building of their army underground, that complicates matters.
Especially when you also need to remember that the warriors are not individuals. They're not soldiers along the same lines as the men and women of the Terran Federation. They are not valuable. They are, to the Arachnids, the same as a bullet is to the Federation. Expendable. The only question is, what can you get in trade for a warrior's existence? An example would be Whiskey Outpost. The Arachnids overrun it with a surprise attack from underground, breaking up into the mess hall, slaughtering the Federation defenders, kidnapping several, and interrogating some. The brain bug way. And then they have them call for help. They set off a distress beacon and they wait for the reinforcements to arrive. They wait for them to get into the outpost, to isolate themselves. And only when there is no easy way for the defenders to escape do the arachnids swarm. Thousands of warrior bugs assault. A defended, fortified position with high steel walls protected by twin heavy caliber gun turrets and now occupied by a full squad of mobile infantrymen. The warriors rush through, a storm of lead and blizzards of fragmentation grenade shrapnel, losing hundreds before they can even try to attack by clambering a mountain of their own dead. The action must have cost the arachnids thousands of warriors, plus a tanker bug, of course. And if they'd actually pulled it off and overrun the outpost, it would have cost them even more bugs. All of that to trap a couple dozen mobile infantrymen. Sounds like a pretty awful trade, but according to the novel, if the bugs can trade a hundred warriors for a single MI, then they're getting out on top. And by quite a margin. Another quote from the book, which goes roughly along the lines of The bug commissars cares not one whit for expanding warriors any more than we do expending ammunition. And that, again, is the true terror of the arachnid warrior. Individually, they're incredibly lethal, but it is the numbers. The ability for the warriors to be wielded as strategic weapons, to be directed as pawns on a chessboard, and ordered to do anything at any cost with no hesitation whatsoever. Oh yes. They are a galaxy-conquering force. And hopefully, with this video, you will now have a better understanding of the Arachnid Warrior. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.